For any writer, the ability to look at a sentence and see what's superfluous, what can be altered, revised, expanded, and especially cut, is essential. Hello. Welcome to Creative Writing Corner. I am Luke, and today we are going to be talking about reading like a writer. My opening sentence there was from a book by that name, Reading Like a Writer by Francine Prose, which is maybe the greatest last name for a writer in history. Her last name actually is Prose, kind of like that guy's last name is Poe, as in poetry. You get it. I love dad jokes. Anyway, so... Prose opens with, Francine prose that is, like most, maybe all, writers, I learned to write by writing, and by example, by reading books. It's on page two. So, she says what probably a lot of us would agree with, a lot of us would understand, that we became writers in part because we love reading, and we want to create stories for other people to read. Now, some of us might be writing because we love movies, or we love comics, or we love plays, and we want to write things for other people to consume in other ways than just simply reading words. But most of us still came to the writing world to put words down on paper to be read by other people. So, this book, I highly recommend it to anyone who wants to write. This is going to help you with your reading as a writer. I teach this book in my creative writing classes. I give a couple chapters of it to my creative writing students in the early part of every year because every year a good portion of the class is dedicated to reading like a writer. We also watch movies like writers and we watch plays like writers. We read comics like writers. We approach everything as a writer in my class. But this is one of the early assignments because it does introduce the topic, the idea of reading like a writer. So she breaks the book into subsections of things that a writer should be looking for as she reads, starting from the microscopic and then moving the camera outward. So she starts off with the very concept of close reading. We'll talk about that. That's going to be our primary focus today. And she goes deeper. She goes delving into words and then expands to sentences and then paragraphs and talks about narration, how the story is told. She talks about character, how characters are created. She talks about dialogue how speech is orchestrated, and then details, where we get details from gesture, what gesture can do in terms of expression, and in terms of communication, communicating meaning, communicating ideas. And then she closes off with the last couple chapters of learning from Chekhov, Chekhov's gun. Chekhov uh, is famous or infamous for saying that don't put a gun on the wall in the first act if it's not going to go off by act three. Meaning, don't set something up that you're not going to pay off. Because that's like one of the biggest sins of writing. And then, last chapter being Reading for Courage. And then she closes up with a list of books to be read immediately. I will reveal a little bit here. I have only read a fraction of those books that she says are to be read immediately. I just don't think Francine Prose and I share the exact same reading taste. She is older than I am, she came up in a different time period, and she just enjoys reading generally different things, although not everything is different. I have read a lot of what she talked about, but not nearly all of it. So anyway, let's delve into what this close reading is. As Prose says, in the ongoing process of becoming a writer, I read and reread the authors I most love. I read for pleasure first, but also more analytically conscious of style, of diction, and of how sentences were formed and information was being conveyed, how the writer was structuring a plot, creating characters, employing detail and dialogue. And as I wrote, I discovered that writing, like reading, was done one word at a time, one punctuation mark at a time, putting every word on trial for its life. I would say that's what you really want to do in rewriting or revising, not necessarily when you're writing your first draft, but certainly when you are revising, you are trying to put every word on trial for its life, every punctuation mark put on trial for its life. And as you read, you're doing a similar thing. All right? So we learn to re write by practice, by doing what we do, of course. 
But we also learn by what we consume. We learn by what we watch. We learn by what we read, especially by what we read. If we're writers, chances are we're readers. Stephen King says, if you want to learn to write well, there's two things you got to do. Write a lot and read a lot. Never stop reading. You must continue to read, continue to feed your mind, and read like a writer. Okay? So, what writers know is that ultimately we learn to write by practice, hard work, by repeated trial and error, success and failure, and from the books we admire. So that's prose. And she's certainly on track there, right? We learn. I didn't learn to write because I took a bunch of writing classes. I was writing fiction before I ever took a fiction writing class. I got published. I got fiction writing published before I ever took a fiction writing class. Now I have a master's degree in the subject. But I learned on my own initially. I learned by reading. I learned by being a huge cinephile and watching tons of movies and having a good eye and a good ear for dialogue and for an understanding of story, understanding what a good movie is and what a good movie is not, understanding that Casablanca is a great film and The Last Airbender is an abomination. I could have understood that. I mean, I didn't see The Last Airbender until I was an adult, obviously, but I saw the Casablanca as a kid and I knew it was a great film, right? That's because I delved into story from a very, very early age. And I've told you guys some of my story beforehand. But as Pro says, we all begin as close readers. Word by word is how we learn to hear and then to read, which seems only fitting because it is how books are, we are reading were written in the first place. So in order to close read a book, in order to read as a writer, you have to read it word by word. This means that reading like a writer is slowing down. Reading like a writer is slowing down and breaking things down analytically, but not analytically like an English student, not analytically like an English major. It's coming at it from a different point of view. Children love the imagination says, with its kaleidoscopic possibilities and its protest against the way children are always being told exactly what's true and what's false, what's real and what's illusion. That particular quote struck a chord with me because that's something I've always been frustrated by. Like we're given all these stories and stuff when we're children and later on we're told that, oh, those aren't true though. Those are just uh, parables and metaphors, myths, things like that, stories. Well, what myth is I learned later on, after I learned that a myth is a lie, I learned that a myth is a story that gives meaning to an experience of life. So far from being a lie, myth is actually some of the truest work you can come across. And that's what we're doing. We're, we're writing fiction. We're telling stories. We are working in the world of myth. We are giving meaning to reality. We're giving meaning and giving a shape and a focus to the world. A work of art can start you thinking about some aesthetic or philosophical problem. It can suggest some new method, some fresh approach to fiction. But the relationship between reading and writing is rarely so clear-cut. So it really starts to go down and she breaks down what reading like a writer is, what close reading is, and how you can close read for words, for sentences, for paragraphs. I often think of learning to write by reading as something like the way I first began to read. I had a few picture books I'd memorized and pretended I could read. I never knew exactly when I crossed the line from pretending to actually be able, from pretending to actually being able, sorry, but that was how it happened. That's probably the way a lot of us learn to read to a certain extent, right? I can remember talking about sentences and letters and whatnot in kindergarten first grade, but I already knew my alphabet before I got to kindergarten. I could already spell my name. Reading just kind of gradually grew from there. I was already flipping through books. Jim Aylesworth, a very successful children's author, was my first grade teacher, and so he had us on books every single day. And I'm very glad I had those influences, plus my mom and dad read a lot, and I always saw them reading. And even though my tastes in literature differed from them somewhat. Still, without them there encouraging me, I don't know if I would have been the reader I was, and I certainly wouldn't be the writer I was if I hadn't been the reader I was. 
Reading a masterpiece can inspire us by showing us how a writer does something brilliantly. Prose says this, I would say that also you can learn not just from reading masterpieces, although I do highly recommend you should read the greats and watch the greats. If you're into movies, watch the great films of all time. Watch Casablanca, watch The Godfather, even watch Citizen Kane. It might not be the most entertaining thing, but you're going to learn a lot as a screenwriter out of doing that. And just as a writer as well, just watching any good film, but particularly in reading. Read the masterpieces, but read the books that are less good as well, with that sharp critical eye, right? And if you read with that sharp critical eye, you are going to learn not just what works, but what doesn't work. You are going to learn what doesn't work, and you are going to learn from a reader's perspective why. And understanding what works and what does not work from a reader's perspective is going to help you as a writer so much, because it's going to help you deliver the information in a way that works for your own readers, because you are going to understand your readers better. Pro says that close reading helped me figure out a way to approach a difficult aspect of writing, which is nearly always difficult. This is how she approached a lot of her writing. Close reading helped her figure out dialogue, figure out characterization, figure out structure. So when reading the classics, you can assume that if a writer's work has survived for centuries, there are reasons why this is so. And part of a reader's job is to find out why certain writers endure. So as a reader, you are basically justifying the, the writer's continued existence, whether they're passed on or not. The writer's works continued existence, right? Why is Shakespeare still relevant today, even though he's been dead for over 400 years? Because his work still speaks to us, right? It still has something to say. It still has something to communicate. And it does so in such an entertaining way that we can be entertained and enthralled and enlightened again and again and again by those same stories. So, why? Why is this? Why, why is close reading so important to writing? Well, it's because words are the raw material out of which literature is crafted, as Proust says. So, if we don't break it down to words and we don't give special attention to the words that the writer is using and notice why she's choosing particular words in each particular part of a piece to communicate a different meaning, then we're really not getting everything we could out of the literature and we're not learning ourselves about our own tools. Words are our basic building blocks. Words and sentences are the basic building blocks of a work of fiction, of any kind of story. We need words and we need sentences. But you can't even have sentences without words. Words are the very, very most basic building blocks and you've got to be able to break them down. So how do we do that? How do you get yourself to close read a work? Well, prose says, one way to compel yourself to slow down and stop at every word is to ask yourself what sort of information each word, each word choice is conveying. Now, the word word choice here is very important. Word choice, because each word is chosen, particularly in a final published work. Each word is chosen by the author. And when you're reading the classics, they're often chosen very, very carefully. When you're reading some more modern work and you're reading work that's more ephemeral, it doesn't last, it's not so classic, there tend to be not be so many unique word choices or interesting word choices. And you know, this is why we're still reading Huck Finn to this day. We're still reading The Great Gatsby, but you don't see many people walking around with the Da Vinci Code, even though it's one of the best-selling novels of the 2000s. Um, I don't want to come hard down on Dan Brown here. He's plenty successful in himself, so I hope he doesn't mind me Ragging on in a little bit, but no one really reads Dan Brown for the writing. They read for the fun ideas and the uh, the fast pace, right? Same reason we read John Grisham, things like that, which are fine. And if you want to tell stories like that, fine. But the chances of you hitting it out of the park with any of those stories are kind of one in a million. Those guys just happen to find the right cultural touchstone to kick off with. 
you're going to have a better chance as a writer of being successful if you write well. And you're certainly going to have a better chance of connecting with your readers and being remembered and touching people down the road and immortalizing yourself as a writer, if that is part of your goal, it's part of my goal. You're going to have a better chance of that if you write better and you're going to learn to write better by reading better stuff and reading carnivorously, as she puts it, as Francine Pros puts it. Reading carnivorously means reading for what can be admired, absorbed, and learned. It involves reading for sheer pleasure, but also with an eye and a memory for which author happens to do which thing particularly well. So if you're into world building and construction of languages and stuff like that, you could do worse than reading J.R.R. Tolkien. If you're into, say, snappy dialogue and clippy, quick descriptions, you could do worse than reading Ernest Hemingway. If you're into more flowery language and more offbeat descriptions and literary allusions, Ray Bradbury and F. Scott Fitzgerald might both give you some ideas to work with there. So read carnivorous, uh, carnivorously, sorry, devour books, devour them slowly, relishing the meat within your teeth there, as it were. When you're expanding beyond words, a beautiful sentence is a beautiful sentence, regardless of when it was written or whether it appears in a play or a magazine article, which is just one of the many reasons why it's pleasurable and useful to read outside of one's own genre. So don't just read deeply, read broadly, right? So the more you read, the more you digest, and the more you read closely and really think about what you're reading, the more effective it's going to be and the better effect it's going to have on you as a writer and the better your writing is going to be. So when talking about the what makes a good sentence or what makes a good word or the right word or the wrong sentence, the right word, the wrong word, the badly worded sentence, it's very difficult to describe exactly this is why you have to do reading. This is why you have to have the experience yourself, because experience is the best teacher, right? So read a lot and write a lot. Beauty in a sentence is ultimately as difficult to quantify or describe as beauty in a painting or a human face, that same prose says. We each have our own ideas of beauty, and it's like the old judge said about pornography. I don't know what it is, but I know it when I see it. I can't describe it, but I know what it, I know it when I see it. Well, it's fine, but the only way to do that is to see it over and over and over again. So don't go look at pornography. Go read over and over and over again. Read closely, and then ask yourself the questions of the reading of the work that you're reading that you would ask when you are revising your own work. Because this is something that is going to help you when you do get to the revision process. As Francine Pro says, among the questions that writers need to ask themselves in the process of revision, is this the best word I can find? Is my meaning clear? Can a word or phrase be cut from this without sacrificing anything essential? Perhaps the most important question is, is this grammatical? She goes on to say that grammar is always interesting, always useful, and she recommends the elements of style, uh, which is something that I talked about a few videos ago when talking about my video on style. So I talked a bit about style and grammar there. It is very important stuff to know. I did not give it the credence that I think I should have before I became an English teacher. Now, knowing grammar has actually, I've always known grammar to a certain extent, but knowing it in more detail the way I do now has made me a better writer since I've started teaching English than I was before. I can put together better sentences, more interesting turns of phrase, even though I often choose to violate the rules of grammar. You must know the rules before you can properly violate them. As she says, and this goes back to my elements of style and the importance of clarity, of clarity and communication, it's necessary to hold the concept of clarity as an even higher ideal than grammatical correctness. And this is why I violate grammatical rules now and then, is because it helps me put forth a clearer message. So these are all things to think about when you're doing 
your own reading, right? When you're reading deeply, break it down in, into words, break it down into sentences, break each character down into their dialogue moments, break the details down. It's not just God in the details, but the times in which we live. So in other words, details tell you a lot about the author, about the story, about the world in which the story is told, not the story in the world, but the world in which it appears. If you're reading something old, or you're reading something from a foreign country, it's not, a, it's not coming from your world. So the details are going to tell you a lot about the world from which it comes. Details aren't only the building blocks with which a story is put together, they're also clues to something deeper. Keys not merely to our subconscious, but to our historical moment. In other words, details give us context. So, going on, she talks about how literature, reading great literature, reading a wide variety, reading, reading outside of your comfort zone, outside of your own field, outside of your own genre, can expand your mind and expand your skills as a writer. It says, literature is an endless source of courage and confirmation. Literature not only breaks the rules, but makes us realize that there are none. So if you're hung up on trying to write the next uh, sparkly vampire bestseller or whatever it happens to be, get off that horse. Go read some other stuff. Let it inform your writing and write something new, something interesting, something relevant to you, something that you can enjoy. You expand your mind, you expand what you read, you can expand what you can enjoy, and therefore you can expand the kind of stories that you can tell. Reading can give you the courage to resist all of the pressures that our culture exerts on you to write in a certain way or to follow a prescribed form. This comes all the way down to even happy endings, guys. You don't need to write happy endings, although you don't need to write depressing endings either. It's not necessary to do certain things a certain way. You don't need to write in three-act structure, although some kind of structure is a very good idea when you are doing your writing, because when you read, you will notice structure. Even in novels that seem unstructured, you will notice beats, and you will notice a gradual build of tension. You will notice the things that we call story structure in almost all of the great stories out there. And you're going to start understanding it in a deeper way when you see it in action. You're going to be able to understand how to put it in your own storytelling. So I know this is kind of a broad brush overview here, guys, but this is the start of a new little mini series I'm doing on this channel, which is going to be called A Writer Reviews. And this will just have to qualify as my review of Francine Prose's Reading Like a Writer. Again, highly recommend it to all you writers out there. Please go pick it up and read it and then apply it to your own reading and read some of the books she recommends if you read some of them uh recommend to me which ones i should read because i've read i've read probably about a dozen of them or so and i've read a little bits and pieces of others but uh, again i don't read all the books that all the great english people tell me i should read i read the books that i enjoy so let me know what you guys enjoy and let me know why you guys enjoy it. Leave a comment down below. What books do you think I should talk about in this Reading Like a Writer series, in this A Writer Reviews series? As it were, what books should I review? What books should I read like a writer and share with you guys? What books are you guys reading right now and how is Reading Like a Writer helping you? I would love to hear from you. Leave comments below. Please subscribe to the channel and like the video. And uh, until then, I've got some more tips and tricks for you next time. Hope you have a great day. Good luck and good writing. And oh yeah, pick up your uh, free character creation template if you haven't done that yet. That'll help give you a shortcut to writing as well. Until next time, guys, peace out. I'll talk to you soon.